I have a rule of thumb, Mike, and it's like when it's negative chatter in your head and you're asking yourself, is this my own resistance or is it really valid? What I'm saying. And I'm saying, when in doubt, it's resistance. In other words, it's always resistance, you know? Okay. When you hear that negative voice in your head, particularly when it's very loud, that's the time when you want to ignore that voice and go right into the fire, you know? Oh, I love it. That's sage advice. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts. This is the Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. Okay, well, I'll just dive into it and um, we'll see where this conversation goes. But I want to give you a proper introduction. You know, I really enjoyed doing the research on on you. And, um, you know, you made, your, you made a professional life in five different writing arenas. Advertising, screenwriting, fiction, narrative, nonfiction, and self-help. Um, best-selling author of, of The Legend of Bagger Vance, Gates of Fire, The Afghan Campaign, and The Lion's Gate, as well as cult classics on creativity, The War of Art, Turning Pro, and Do the Work. Your Wednesday column on stephenpressfield.com is one of the most popular series on writings on the web today. And then your most recent work, A Man at Arms, which, which I definitely want to dig into later on in the show, which is an epic saga about a reluctant hero of the Roman Empire and the rise of a new faith. So I look, I look forward to digging into all of that, but I want to understand, or I want listeners to understand like what it took for a Stephen Pressfield to get to where you are today. And uh, like I said, I enjoy doing the research on you and... Um, I want to go back to that time, Stephen. So reading your resume, I'm going to shut up here in a minute, I, but I, I feel like these are all <laughs> necessary to lay the groundwork so people understand, right? Like it took you 17 years before earning any money as a writer and 27 years before you got your first novel, Legend of Bagger Vance. You were Duke graduate, spent some time in the military. You're a school teacher, truck driver, worked in oil fields, pick fruit um and you're homeless living in a in a tent or living in your car so take <laughs> me back to that story take me to living in a tent whenever your best friend was what i what i gathered was a cat that would come visit you from time to time <laughs> it's funny i actually i lived uh, i had a 65 chevy van i did never lived in a tent okay but, uh, okay that may but, have been uh, the story i made up in my head but the, the story of the cat is um at one point, uh, when I was driving trucks in North Carolina, in Ra around Raleigh, North Carolina, I lived in a house for, I think it was 15 bucks a month. And it was kind of a cinder block house out in the boonies that had no doors, no windows, no running water, no, no lights, nothing. And uh, the way that uh, I, would, I would eat, make my meals, is I would build a, like, a little campfire out behind the house and I would sit on the on the cinder block stoop there and the woods, you know, North Carolina is like it's pine woods everywhere. Right. And uh, so the woods kind of started like five feet from where I was cooking my I'd cook my hot dog or whatever the hell I was having for dinner that night. And there was this cat, a feral cat, a wild cat, like an old battle scarred tomcat that lived in the woods. And he would come out at night and sit across from me at the uh, watch me and watching me eat. And this happened like, I don't know, I tried to, I remember it like maybe 10 times. It probably was only three times, but it certainly was multiple times. And I couldn't feed him. I tried to like toss him a scrap of hot. He wouldn't take it. You know, he was, he was too proud to take it. And he just sort of, he just kind of looked at me like there was, as I, I write about this, I think in the war of art. And I said, there was no doubt 
which one of us was the superior being, you know, and which <laughs> one of us had his shit together and which one of us, you know, knew what was going on. Right. And I really admired this cat. And I thought it was a, because I felt he is self-contained, self-sufficient. He doesn't need anybody taking care of him. He hunts his own food. He's, you know, and I thought to myself, I want to be like this cat. I said, this is a, a, a great role model, and it's a great thing that he materialized. You know, why would a cat just kind of suddenly come out of the woods and sit across me? It's crazy. But, right. um, you know, and as soon as I would finish eating, he'd go back in the woods. I'd go back in, in the house, and that was it. But I, I, I considered that a really good omen at the time. Yeah, so a couple of questions on that. Did you ever name – what was the cat's name? Oh, I have no idea. It was just his own, his own self. You know, he was yeah. a wild cat. And and how ha- and how old were you at that time? Uh, how old was I? About, I think I was still in my twenties, twenty eight, something like that, twenty seven, okay. twenty eight. So, were you writing at that time? Like while you were doing these odd jobs? Were no, you I wasn't. You know, I had sort of started and tried to write a novel at the very big. You know, when I was young, uh-huh. twenty three, twenty four, and it completely. I choked. I totally flamed out. I blew it up, blew my marriage life up. And then I was on the road for that period that you were talking about. And basically, I was just running away from writing. You know, I just couldn't, you know, this type. This isn't the actual typewriter here, but I had a typewriter with me in my van. um, And I just never touched it. I just had it in the back, you know. And yeah, so I was just running away. No, I was not writing at, at all at that time. I got you. In fact, if you had put a gun to my head and demanded me to do it, I would have run away into the woods after the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to back up like that. That, that uh, I have a lot of questions that come to mind about that. But like, what was it in the beginning before you even wrote the started writing and, and what you said blew up? Like, what was it that got you into writing to begin with? Like, was it family? Did you have family that, that were writers or where did that stem uh, from? Yeah, I uh, no, I never had any kind of dream of being a writer as a kid, nothing like that. Um, but I was working in advertising. I had a job as like a junior copywriter at an agency in New York City. And I had a boss named Ed Hannibal, and he quit and wrote a novel, and it was a hit. And like overnight, the guy was famous, you know. So yeah. I said, you know, most well, shit, why don't I do that too? <laughs> right, so that was, you know, it seemed like, you know, what could go wrong? So that was how I started. I started like a complete idiot. I had no idea what I was getting into. I just thought it sounded like a good thing to do, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of your story too, right? A 27-year overnight success? Yeah. You know, sort of having started that and then fail, failing so ignominiously, and I sort of felt like I've got to kind of write my way out of this somehow, you know? Right. I've got to continue this and and. To, to some kind of ending, whatever that may be. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bounce around a little bit here, but like while this is on my mind, I would be remiss if I didn't take this time to thank you. Um, the War of Art, man, was one that changed my life, changed my path, and I feel like is a big part of the reason why I'm sitting here today talking to you. You know, I had a lot of resistance um, towards this podcast and just putting myself out there. I, I went through a divorce and, man, it was all I could do just to come out from under the covers every day, you know? And so I know what you mean. Like I was on this Island. Um, that book opened my eyes to what resistance was, what I was feeling at that time, you know, and matter of fact, Steven, that's one of the, that and turning pro is, um, two books that I gift most often to other people. Huh. And last I, night, let I me was ask having, you, go let ahead, me ask you something, Mike, um, yeah. what form did resistance take for you? What were the, well, can you give me some details? Let me in- interview you for a second. Sure. Tell me a little bit about what uh, what form it took for you. So, yeah, it would be, I guess, like fear of judgment. You know, for myself, uh, a lot of it was self-judgment. I-, I played baseball growing up all the way through college, and so I was very competitive. But with that, like, we can be our own worst critic, critic at times. And um, I definitely was, and I didn't even realize it. Like, I had no awareness around any of it. And like I told you before the show started, like I dove off into fit for service with Aubrey Marcus. And so that started opening my eyes to some awareness practices, some of those things. And actually one of the, the war of art was a recommended read. We had recommended reads. Oh, is that right? Uh-huh. uh-huh. Yeah. And um, 
So I would say fear, just just the fear of judgment, a lot of ego involved with that, you know. Uh huh. And that's a very broad answer, but um, uh -huh. that was it in a nutshell. So what was the dream that you were pursuing to have a podcast? Is that what you were be feeling resistance to? Well, gosh, I'm trying to go back to that time. Um, you know, I was in pharmaceutical sales at the time, but I was also buying rental property because I wanted to be an investor and do that uh -huh. full time for freedom, right? Financial uh -huh. freedom. And so I had resistance to leaving the job even though like things kept coming up, like pushing me to go out on my own. And um, one thing Aubrey says, and it made a lot of sense, like everything happens as it's supposed to, you know, life is happening for us and not to us. And so I think that the last thing I said was from Don Miguel Ruiz, but um, it, it was just one of those things. I don't know if I just kept ignoring it or I would build, build calluses around it, but I was scared to acknowledge it. Like I was scared to confront what this thing was, you know, I just kept pushing it back. Uh -huh. We all know that. So it was sort of going out on your own. In other words, that was what the, the fear was too, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, uh -huh. that. And so, and, and then the podcast thing came to mind. I'm like, man, I've got, I want to scratch my own itch. I listened to a lot of Tim Ferriss and, um, uh, Tim talks about, um, you know, starting a podcast and what, what that entails. And he's like, it's first and foremost, you got to scratch your own itch. It's got to be genuine curiosity. And, and, uh, and it is, and, and, but I was still scared to take the next step. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and actually, uh, Aubrey's one of Aubrey's camera guys gave me some wise advice, um, through the fit for service thing. He's like, man, if this is what you want to do, just what is the next step? Very simple. Yeah, yeah, step. that's great. That's like, great you know, advice. Yeah. Shit, just buy some equipment. He's like, Are you uh -huh. gonna buy some equipment and then uh -huh. do the next step. Uh -huh. So Yeah, I mean I have a I have a thing that I say, which is uh put your ass where your heart wants to be. Yeah. Which is really sort of exactly that. It's like if you want to be a podcaster, well get a microphone, you know, get yeah. a camera, right? And yeah. then and that starts kind of the momentum going. Yeah. Why is it the thing that we want to do the most, we have the most fear around? Um, it's a strange, I don't know, but the, that's the way the world works, you know? Yeah. Um, like uh, for me, you know, I just was telling you that story about, you know, how I tried to write a novel and it blew up or I blew it up. And then I was, you know, I was sort of, you know, wandering around the country working various jobs and stuff like that. There, the, what sort of, pulled me out of that was recognizing that there is a force that when we're striving to get to a higher level, that it's going to try to stop us. You know, it seems counterintuitive. It seems like, why would there be something there to stop us? But there absolutely is. And I've got the 10,000 emails from people to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's almost like that is the default, right? Like the negative chat, yeah. the negative self-talk, that's easy. Like that just floods in. Yes. Yeah, there's no getting around it. It's the first thing that happens is, you know, you'll start psyching yourself out with self-doubt, procrastination, fear, or or the, the opposite end of that, arrogance, complacency, perfectionism. You can't begin until it's absolutely right, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's a there definitely is that force that I call resistance with a capital R that's trying to stop us anytime we were trying to move to from a lower level to a higher level. It's infallible. And why, man, it's like the ego has like two sides to it. Do you think that ego can be used if you have a tight grip of awareness, like the, on the reins of, of the ego, do you think it can be used benef like in a beneficial way or like in a positive way? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by it, having a tight grip on the rain. Can you use it in terms of what you went through so I can explain it? Hear it? Sure. Understand like it? ego, like why do I, why do I want to do good? At, you know, why do I want to do good at anything? Or why does anybody want to do good? Why do we want people to like us? Like, I feel like some of that is ego driven, right? Like what, and then like my, my biggest thing lately has been balance, like finding the balance in wanting to do good and having a genuine intent. Does that make sense? Or am I, am I just kind of talking? No, I think, I think it does make sense. I mean, it's, it's, you know, one of the sort of breakthroughs for me, and this came from a dream was I realized that I was ambitious and this had been something that I'd really held down 
before, you know, and, and I thought it was like a bad thing. You know, I'm kind of a child of the 60s, and the, the, the sort of the concept then was that uh, if you wanted to put yourself forward, if you wanted to be ambitious, if you had aspiration, that the only what would happen is you do it at the expense of other people. You know, it would be like a competition. And that was thought of as like really bad. And I really thought that that was bad. You know, I don't want to be pushing anybody out of the way, you know, to get something I want, you know. So I really tried to like totally dial down that ambition. And then at some point I just realized, you know what? I am ambitious. I want to do something good. I want to make a, a mark somewhere in the world. You know, I didn't even know what it was, but I'm tired of being a bum. I'm tired of being a loser. I'm tired of, you know, hiding my light under a bushel. I yeah. want to actually do something. I didn't know what, but that was a very freeing thing. So I think it's, it's not necessarily ego. It's, it's something that, um, if you think of it in terms of a gift, that we all have a gift. You've got one, I've got one. And to to want to give that gift, what's wrong with that? Right. You know, if you're if you're a great singer and you want to sing, what's wrong with that? You know? Yeah. So it's a that was a big then, breakthrough right? to me. I realized that I was ambitious and that was okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a shift in per, in perception, I guess. Yeah. Tell me this. I heard, I think it was um, an interview maybe with Tim Ferriss. You were talking about building on momentum and building on the little successes. Can you talk about some of that, like in your early days, you know, some of those successes that you were able to to realize and and, and capitalize on that, that gave you that boost you needed? Well, I think the way when I was talking with Tim, it was sort of about in the, in the course of your daily schedule, you know, and the concept of little successes was that uh, if you, let's, let's tell it from the point of view of a writer, that you know you're going to have to sit down at one point in the day and actually confront the blank page, right? Yeah. The stuff that you're really afraid to do. So building up to that, you want to try to have little successes along the way. Like if you were to go to the gym early in the morning or run or do something like that, that, went, that that would count as a success. Well, I went there, I worked out, I did whatever it was, you know? And you're trying to get a little momentum going so that when you actually sit down to do your work, you, you're not going from a standing start. You've already kind of got, oh, the day's going good. I've done things that I meant to do. You know, I mailed those letters, I talked to those people, I took care of this business. Right. Now I'm ready to really get to work. Right. So that's in the sense of like a routine, which I think is important, you know, especially I'm big on morning routine. I wake up very early and uh, do those things so I can, I can, um, you know, have that feeling. But like at some point for me, like that feeling goes away and like I feel, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I need to do more, you know, like I need to do more to fulfill that, you know. Um, but I feel like the same, like the same principles apply just in life and, and, and like daily goals or weekly goals, you know, building on those, on those, um, little successes, those little wins for me, like I tend to look at, at the macro and I I'll be over, I'll get overwhelmed. You know, I try to do uh -huh. too much shit at one time. Yeah. What is, do you have any advice on that? This will be an interview slash counseling session, Steven. I'll, <laughs> I'll let you help me out, man. Yeah. Like I say, which one of us is keep counseling the other? <laughs> But, well, I will say one thing to that, because I, I definitely agree with that, Mike. It's like, like for me, uh, as, as, a, as a writer trying to get up to actually get a novel published, like you said, it took me, whatever, 27 years. I had a career, like a 10-year career as a screenwriter, right before I, I finally got a novel published. And that was, like you say, that was little successes. Yeah. You know, it was... Uh, you know, nothing great came out of it, you know, but nothing I could write home about. But I, you know, you hit certain milestones, you know, you make your first paycheck, you do your first thing that was is totally on spec, that's not an assignment. And you sell a script that you just came out of your, your own head, you know, and you go, wow, I guess I've got some ability, somebody just paid me some money. And at the same time, you're really learning your craft. You know, right. so that at, at the beginning, you you were just totally winging it, trying to write something or do anything. Right. But as you learn your craft, you go, oh, I see what a story is. There's a act one, act two, act three, blah, blah, blah. Right. 
like learning to be a brain surgeon. You know, you learn to make that first incision or whatever they do, you know, yeah. and those little successes do build up so that at a certain point you say to yourself, you know what? I can do this shit. You know, I've done it before. Right. I know how it works. There's no mystery to it. Yeah. And I know that I can make myself do it. Right. And, and so I think that you're right. That really over that over, you know, for me, like a 20 or 30 year period, finally, uh, you know, I could never say to myself, I'm a writer. I, it was like a fantasy to me. You know, I could never, I'd say, well, I'm trying to be, but I'm not, you know, but at some point over the series of successes that you had, you say to yourself, shit, I'm a writer, you know, I, here's my paycheck, you know, here, you know, I, I haven't had to pick fruit for the last 12 years, so I must be doing something right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But it does sometimes for some of us takes a long time. It isn't yeah. just an instant thing. It's learning a craft. Yeah, I love it. And that's something, you know, that's buzzing around right now is, you know, the delay, delayed gratification, like building the layers of that confidence, this abstract thing we call confidence, you know, and, and we do. We know the real confidence versus what what we may put on at times. But yeah, yeah. Going through what you go through and, and, and most everybody that I've sat down with, like from a artistic standpoint, whether they're songwriters or authors, like, man, they spent some time in the trenches. You know, I think you 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 take the 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 prize as far as how long but I don't know. I take that back. Like Barry Corbin, the guy that played in Lonesome Dove, like he didn't land his first role on Urban Cowboy until he was in his 40s, I think, you know? Yeah. So here's my question around that, right? So delayed gratification. Um, how do you know when it's time to pivot? Like, how do you know, like, I'm going to stick with this no matter what until I succeed or, man, maybe this isn't my path. I'm going to pivot and go down this road. How do you like trust intuition or distinguish between? Yeah, that's, your a, path? that's a tough, that's a tough one. I, I mean, like you say, life sort of happens for you. What was it? What was it you said that Aubrey said? Yeah, it's not life. happening to you. It's happening for you or something that right. sometimes um, it's a circuitous path. Like for me to get to be, to write a novel. First, I did like three of them over, you know, a 10, 12 year period, total failure, nothing at all. Right. Yeah. Then I went and then I, out of desperation, I tried writing movies, you know, and then after, you know, 10 years of that, suddenly I was able to zig back. You know, I, it just sort of, it just kind of happened. You know, it was like I had put enough time in grade I had really absolutely given up on writing novels, which was my original dream. I just gave up. I can't do it. I'll never be able to do it. But after 10 years of writing movies, I suddenly the, the legend of bag of Rance kind of came to me as, as a book, not as a, so it wasn't a choice. It wasn't like at that point, it was a big pivot, but I really had no, no choice. I was just kind of seized by it. There it was either I was going to do it or I was going to, you know, blow up, you know, my head would explode. So I just right. had to do it. Life seems to tell us, you know. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now or, you know, have been for a while just trying to figure out how do you trust intuition or or distinguish if it's negative chatter, you know, or you know what I mean? Yeah. Is it intuition saying, no, don't do this? Or is that negative chatter and resistance saying. I have, I have a rule of thumb. Growth? I have a rule of thumb, Mike, and it's like when it's negative chatter in your head and you're asking yourself, is this my own resistance or is it really valid, what I'm saying? And I'm saying, when in doubt, it's resistance. In <laughs> other words, it's always resistance, you know? Okay. When you hear that negative voice in your head, particularly when it's very loud, that's the time when you want to ignore that voice and go right into the fire, you know? Oh, I love it. That's sage advice. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true that the more um, important a dream is to our evolution, our soul evolution, the more resistance we'll feel to it. So when we're feeling a shitload of resistance, and that voice is really loud in our heads, that's really a good sign because it's telling us, you know, that this, this is something we need to do. It's like yeah. resistance itself. If we think of it as a person or an individual, it's infallible. And if it's 
if it's really trying to stop you, <laughs> then what it's trying to stop you from doing is something you got to do. Yeah. Because resistance knows that it's really good for you and it doesn't want you to do it. Yeah. It's the devil. And it, and it like hits at different stages, right? Like, like whether we're starting something new, brand new, or six months in or two years in, it like comes, I feel like for me, like in different stages and different forms. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's definitely predictable points when resistance will hit in any project, just like you're, you're just saying at the start, in the middle, at the end, when yeah. it's all done, it'll hit again. You know, it's definitely yeah. uh, a very predictable force, a yeah. force of nature that's very predictable. It's like if I drop something, it's going to fall. Same thing with resist. If you start a project, you're going to be hit by resistance at the start hit by resistance once you get rolling a little bit, then in the middle, it's going to hammer you. And then right at the end, it's going to hammer you. And then once you're done, just for good measure, it's going to hammer you again. <laughs> I want to I want to kind of use that as a segue into like your writing process. I've heard you talk about the muse a lot and writing um, process in, in, in the sense of like tapping into a flow state, you know, which I don't feel like any amount of resistance can touch you when you're in a flow state. You know what I mean? Like when all time disappears uh -huh. and you're just in the zone. Um, we'll start with like setting. Like, can you tell me, guys, so, it sounds so like such a generic question. Like, I'm not going to ask you what is your inspiration, but like set the scene. Like when you go to write a book, like let's take a man, for, a man at Arms. When you started writing that, like time of day, what vices are you using? Like coffee, <laughs> caffeine, drugs, tobacco. How are you tapping into <laughs> the muse? You know what I mean? Yeah, I got a bottle of Jack Daniels and I start right while you hear I'm those... still in bed. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you hear the romanticized stories of writers and, and having to lean on that stuff. So I'm curious, you know, as accomplished from... as you are, how do you do it? I'm, I'm from the opposite school of like boozing and, you know, that sort of stuff. I'm, I, I think of it as a very much of a blue collar scenario, you know, okay. and, and um, uh, I, I'm like you, I get up real early. I have a whole sort of early morning routine. We're at little successes, go to the gym, do whatever it is it takes. And until I, I've got my head completely clear, I've gotten all the bullshit out of the way. And this is usually around 1030 or something in the morning for me. And I will turn everything off. You know, no devices or anything like that. Close the door and just and just focus for however long it takes. For me, it's maybe I used to be able to work for four hours straight. That was my max. Now I can maybe do three. That's all. But in that time, I'm just trying. My only goal is to try as hard as I can just to do something. You know, I'm not judging myself at all. I turn off the self sensor and I'm just going to try to, I don't have a, like a number of words I want to do. All I want to feel like at the end of the day, when I close up shop is that I put in a good day's work. You know, I, I analogize it to like going, working in a coal mine, you know, I go down in the mine, I'm going to be shovel my 16 tons. I can't, I can't, you know, judge, Oh, is it good coal? Is it bad coal? I don't even care. I just got to, you know, and, and I feel like, if I can just start working, you know, uh, from minute one, minute two, minute 10, minute 15, minute, uh, you know, at some point, I will get into a little bit of a flow. At some point, my self-consciousness will go away and I'll just be in the story. Whatever it is I'm writing, I'll be in that world and, and it'll, it'll happen. And if it doesn't happen, I come back the next day and I do it again. And the other, the other thing that I look at is, like with a man at arms, which is the most, my most recent book starting it, I knew this is going to take me two, two and a half years. So set my, I set my mind for that. You know, I asked myself, do I love this enough that I can put that much time in? And, you know, once I was satisfied, yes, I do. Yes. It's a story I want to tell. Then I kind of adopt that sort of marathon runners point of view. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not looking for instant gratification. I know I'm going to write maybe 15 drafts of this book. I'm going to go through it once and again and again and again and again. And, and I'm, I'm stealing myself to really be patient, 
you know, it's a, it's a long-term operation. And um, that, that's my mindset. I feel like I'm going to work every day. Yeah. It's like a factory. And when the day's over, then the day's over and I wait and I start the next day. I like the quote. Um, I think it was in a war of art where you said someone, someone once asked Somerset Mon if he wrote on a schedule or only when inspiration struck. And his reply was, I write only when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes every morning at 9 a.m. sharp. Yeah, that's a great, that is, I love that quote because he's a working professional, you know, and I think most, most writers and most artists are, you know. Uh, I'm sure that Stevie Wonder or Jackson Brown or Bob Dylan don't go into their little studio with a piano or whatever is thinking, today I'm going to write something fantastic. They just know, today I'm going to sit down, I'm going to work. I may, If I was working on something yesterday, I'm going to continue working on it. I'm just going to, you know, it's it's really is like a coal mine, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a, a blue collar process. But that being said, inspiration, the muse, whatever that magical state is, yeah. I think the muse, the goddess who's watching us, when she sees us working hard every day, she likes that. She approves of that. And at some point she'll say, you know, this son of a bitch is working. He's working hard. He's a good servant of mine. I'm going to give him a good idea today. I'm yeah. just going to let it pop into his head something great. And <laughs> I, and I, th I think that's how it works. Let's talk about that a little bit because that 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 piqued my interest, and I, I heard you talk about it quite a bit, like in other interviews that I had watched. You know, like first for for listeners, like can you define what muse is to you? Okay, that's a great question. Um, in Greek mythology, the muses were goddesses. They were nine sisters, the daughters of Zeus, the king of the gods and mnemosyne, which means memory. And each muse had a different art that, that she was in charge of. Like there was one muse for dance, another muse for music, another muse for poetry, so on and so forth. And kind of the classic um, visualization of the muse would be something like Beethoven at the piano, and this goddess would be like whispering in his ear, you know, humming a tune, and that was, that was how, it, how it goes. And Elizabeth Gilbert talks about this a lot too where it's sort of the question of where do ideas come from? And right. do, are we the songwriter, we the movie maker, are these really our ideas? Uh, you know, can we really say, oh, I did that? And I think once you've done this for a while, you realize they're not your ideas, you know? It's like you find them on the street or they come into your head while you're driving on the freeway. Um, and so you, you learn a respect for whatever this strange source is. And, and you realize that your job is kind of to get out of the way and let it let it come. And then once it does come, to remember it, you know, or to be be there at the keyboard so you can write it down. Yeah. Um, so it's a strange thing. It's this creative process, in my experience. On the one hand, it's very mystical. And on the other hand, it's very much of a blue collar, you know, work a day type of thing. Right. You may have just answered a question I've been asking a lot lately, like, how do we know what is the most productive use of our time? Like, how do we know what's productive or how do we know what's non-productive? You know, I don't know if anybody can answer it. I think time will tell. But as I've sat down with more musicians and songwriters, it's like the ideas come to them not when they're sitting at their desk, but like when they're washing dishes or working on a ranch somewhere. Like, but is your antenna up to be able to catch and tune in and write it down. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. I mean, when, I mean, I'm not a musician and I've never done that kind of work in a studio, but when you see it in these documentaries, you know, it's a band and they're hanging around and they're smoking and they're drinking and they're just screwing yeah. around. And, and then all of a sudden somebody will come up with a riff or something and, and then they'll build on it, build a song around it or something. Yeah. But I think there's some wisdom to that in the sense, I think that when they're messing around, they're not really messing around. What they're doing is they're somehow trying to sort of clear their heads, get their own sort of ego out of the way and looking for that moment like when you're in the shower and you have a great idea or you're driving down the freeway or you're taking a walk in the woods or whatever. When, when your ego kind of goes away, you're in almost a twilight state. Sometimes for me, it'll happen like lying in bed, 
you know, and, you know, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll have something going through my head and I'll, you know, get out my phone or my tape recorder, you know, and I'll write it down. But I think that's what those, you know, there's some sort of story that like with the Rolling Stones, I have no idea if this is true, <laughs> that they would send Keith down into the basement with his guitar and they'd just stay up drinking and doing whatever they were doing. And they were waiting for Keith to come back with some kind of a, you know, a, a guitar line. And then they'd take it from there. Yeah. Um, so I, God knows what he was doing down in the basement, but that's where we really want to be. Yeah. It's almost like the more you let go at t- as an entrepreneur, I'll say this, like as an entrepreneur, like I'm hyper focused on productivity and the, my, the efficiency of my time, you know? Um, but the more I sit down with folks, it's like, I don't know if it, does it come down to intent, Stephen? Is it like, what is your focused intent? Whether I, whether I consider my, whatever I'm doing, like productive or non-productive. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out, like, should I let, should I just let go more, you know, versus trying to be so strict, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, in, yeah, I'm trying to, instead of trying to be so strict with my routine every single day and have everything planned out, I feel like I should just let go more. But that's so hard. Like, why is surrender to that so hard? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a really a tough question, you know, Mike, because you, you, uh, you want to sort of sit down and really focus you know, that seems to make the most sense. Yeah. And I'm a believer in that. But at the same time, you can get kind of constipated doing that. You know, <laughs> you're, you're you're trying so hard that you can't, you know, you can't get out of your own way. Exactly. Um, so, like, for me, what sort of has worked for me is, you know, while I'm doing that four hour period, then I'm, I'm really focused and I'm really working hard. But once that period is over, I say to myself, the office is closed and I sort of, and I, and then I I allow myself to fuck off, you know, mentally, you know, and that a lot of times is when the good ideas come. But I think it's very important in that time not to be obsessing about what you're working on, you know, and not, but to, to let it go completely. And that's, I think a lot of times when the good ideas come and then if you can kind of write them down, then when it's time to go kind of back into the office, then focus on them then. Yeah. But you're right. It's, it's tough. I mean, a big, for me, for years and years trying to learn to be a writer, I was trying so hard that I just couldn't get out of my own way. And, and, uh, you know, I was so self-conscious. I was so, um, trying to put myself in the mind of the reader and is somebody going to like this? Am I going to feel like, am I look like an asshole when I write this or is this, you know, and, and the whole sort of uh, trick was to learn to let go of that somehow and yeah. not try quite so hard. Now, you know, I just was telling you how I work for four hours or whatever. I am trying hard then, but it's a different kind of trying hard. It's sort of, I've somehow learned how to do it where I don't, I'm not in my own way anymore. I'm not in my own ego mind. And, but it took me a long time to get there and I hope I don't lose it. (laughs) No, I love it. It's like a balance. You have found the balance that works for you, right? Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of like that. uh, I'm sure you've read Zen and the Art of Archery. I haven't. No. Ah, put this on your list. Okay. Zen and the Art of Archery. Um, it's by uh, the guy's last name is Herigel, H E R R I G E L. And uh, he was a young philosopher, a German. And um, he was sort of doing like what you and Aubrey were doing, trying to get to the high achieving, whatever it was. And so he went to Japan and he enrolled in this academy, this Zen academy, where they taught you how archery. And archery was sort of like, uh, a medium to it. It was like martial arts or calligraphy or flower arrangement or something. It wasn't really about archery. It was, that was just a metaphor. And the big thing apparently for him that it took him forever to learn. And the teacher would tell him, you know, once you draw the bow, you're not allowed to release it with your mind. You're not allowed to release the arrow consciously. You have to sort of let it go all by itself. And he could never learn to do that. He was like constantly trying so hard you know, it's almost like shooting with a, 
with a pistol or with a rifle, you know, where they say, you know, you pull it right up to the wall and then just squeeze, squeeze, squeeze you know, and then the, the, the gun, the shot goes off by itself. And it's so hard to do because all of a sudden you'll find yourself jerking the trigger or he would let go of the arrow and then it would go wrong. You know, we would miss. And it's sort of a Zen exercise. I guess it took him a long, long time. I guess he finally learned how to do it. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here of, of, uh, not trying so hard that you screw yourself up, that you get in your own way. But how do you do that? How do you not try? It's, it's, you know, it's really hard. Yeah. I, I, uh, it, it reminds me of the scene that, have you seen that movie forgetting Sarah Marshall? No, I never did. No, I know the one you mean, but I haven't seen it. No, but I'll butcher it. But like Paul Rudd is a, is a surf instructor on the beach and he's just this stoner guy, real hippie, you know, and, He's, he's given lessons um, to the main character um, on how to surf. And, he, and they're on the beach, and he's like, all right, now stand up. And so the guy stands up, you know, and the boy's like, well, no. He's like, you got to do less, like do less. And so he does it again a little bit slower, and, and, uh, the guy, and Paul Rudd's like, no, 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 do less. And so then the guy's just laying there, you know, and he's like, uh-huh. well, you got to do more than that, you know. And so... <laughs> It, that when I think about like letting go and surrender, it reminds me of that, you know, and there is a balance, but it's in the details. And I think for every individual, um, it's going to be different, you know, and it's like I said, it seems like you figured it out um, just through years of doing it, you know? Yeah, I think so. But, you know, I mean, I've never been an actor. I've never been in an acting class or anything like that. I don't know if you have, but apparently acting is sort of the same thing, right? Where they keep telling you, oh, you're acting. Stop yeah. acting. You yeah. know, do less, do less, right? Yeah. And and I know that there was there's one exercise. A friend of mine was taking his acting class, and he told me that the the exercise they had them do. You know, one actor would get up on the stage, and the others would be in the audience. And he said, "Just be natural." You know, just you know, go over, put your coat on the table, and it was like the hardest thing in the world to do because you become immediately self-conscious, right? Oh, people are watching me. I've got to really try to really be. Yeah. And and again, how do you do that? How do you do less? I don't know. It's a, yeah. a long, long process, I guess. That was one of my favorite classes in college. I did take an acting class. Ah, and uh, I was. I mean, I tell people I majored in baseball, but. Um, that was one of the classes like that I got the most out of that I still use today, you know? I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah. So along those same lines, this question I have, like, what are your thoughts whenever you hear people say, just be you, just be you. And, and so I journal about this and I meditate about it. And it's like, how can you just be, what does that even mean? If you have like, if you have a growth mindset and you're constantly changing, just be you. Yeah, that's a hell of a thing, too. I mean, I'm I'm a believer, this is my theory after all of my long years here, that we don't we don't have a clue who we are, you know? Um, and I think that like for let's imagine Bruce Springsteen's albums. Let's say we have a list of all his albums in front of us, and you're asking yourself, who is Bruce Springsteen? I think the answer is that he has revealed himself to himself as much as to the world by the the songs he has written, by the works that he has produced. That's who he is. And I'm sure that, and I, I can say this for my own self, that a lot of the books that I've written, I never had any clue that I was going to write that book before I started. It wasn't like I had a five-year plan. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. A lot of times it's a complete surprise. And I'm sure that this is true of songwriters and, and anybody that creates something. And probably in your career too, Mike, you know, where you you suddenly have an idea and it doesn't seem like it's it's you right it's not really you um like a lot of you know uh i wrote like five books before man at arms that were set in the ancient world ancient greece ancient rome before i did that i had no clue in the world that i was going to do that and uh so it's like i revealed myself to myself through, through what I did. And it's still a mystery to me. I still don't know who I am as an artist. I'm always looking, or as a person, I'm always looking for what's the next thing that's going to seize me and that I can sort of put myself at the service of that idea, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And, and I'm sure that that's the way Bruce Springsteen sees an, an album. Did he think about the ghost of Tom Joad or Springsteen on Broadway? I bet he wasn't planning any of that. It just suddenly it seized him. You know, he found yeah. himself drawn in that in that area. And he just said, I'm going to serve that that impulse. I'm going to put myself at the service of it and go with it. Yeah. I so I don't it. think we know who the hell we are. I, I think you're right. And I, and I, and when you think you do, that's when you need to be worried. You know, it's like, yeah, it, it never ends. Like at some point I thought if I got to this place monetarily, and if I had this wife and this house, that that was the Mecca, like that was that I had made it. Like I was identifying as this thing and uh, like, it was not a happy place. You know, <laughs> so that's why I say now, like the journey is the destination and everything you just said validates what I believe. It's like, it's constant. Like we're constantly figuring this thing out. It's a constant practice, you know? Yeah. Let me recommend a book to you here. Have you ever heard of Richard Rohr? R-O-H-R. He's actually a Franciscan monk. And he wrote a book called Falling Upward. Uh, and the concept of the book, it's like just what you said, Mike. He says he divides life into two halves. And he says the first half of life, we're getting married, we're getting a job, we're investing in real estate, we're buying a Cadillac, we're, we're sort of establishing our ego identity, right? And he says, but then the second half of it, or he describes that as like establishing a vessel, we're creating a vessel that's ourselves, right? In the eyes of the world. But in the second half of life, he says, we have to ask ourselves, well, what are we going to put in this vessel? What is this thing for? You know, and it's it makes sense. It's like your first half of life is like about the ego. And the second half is about the self with a capital S, you know. And it makes sense that, you know, we do want to establish that we can live in this world. We can make money. We can, you know, fall in love. We can have a family. We can establish an identity. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, what do we do with that? How do we, what's our gift? How do we serve our brothers and sisters, you know? What are we here for? Just to belong to a country club or make more money. Right. No, I love that. And I, I did. I wrote that down. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. Falling Upward by Richard Rohr. I highly recommend it. That's a question that can be pondered until you, the day you die, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and even after. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to go back to the muse just for a minute, man. Like I want to hang on that for a little bit because it's something that I lean, that I'm thinking a lot about lately, like I journal and I write, like I'll spend hours writing um, just to myself. Like it's not for anybody else. Like I just do it. It's a form of therapy in a way, you know, just to get my, my thoughts down. Um, getting past the conscious mind, like is the muse, I know you gave a beautiful description of what that is, but is it also like our soul or like our unconscious mind um, in a way, bypassing the conscious and just kind of flowing through it, almost like channeling. Is it like channeling in a way? I, I would say that. Absolutely. You know, I think that um, like, let's say a songwriter is ride, driving along the freeway and a song suddenly comes into her head. Right. Yeah. She's got the verses. She's, you know, she screeches to a stop on the side of the freeway and writes it all down as fast as she can. Where is that coming from? You know, it's coming from someplace else. Right. I, I think it, it it does come from the unconscious or the soul or the self or something like that. I'm I'm a believer that songs and books and all creative things kind of exist already on another plane of reality, a plane of potentiality, and that our job is to bring them into into existence on the material plane. And so the artist's job is like you were talking, tuning into the cosmic radio station. And, and hearing that, you know? Yeah. Will you do much of that? Like, if we're going to lean into the metaphysical, we'll get a little woo-woo here for a minute if you're okay with that. Yeah. But, like, are you doing any visualizations or meditations, like, in the sense of, like, of affirmations, um, as far as what you want to write or what you want a book to do or anything along those lines? No, I don't. I don't do that. To me, sort of the actual sitting down to the page, that's my kind of form of, of meditation, like... Um, you know, we talk about channeling, you know, sometimes it's an, it's an exercise, right. In sort of automatic writing, you know, they'll do for therapy, just sit down, just write anything, you know, stream of conscious, anything comes to your mind. Now I'm not saying that I do that. I don't do that. But when I'm, 
when I'm working on a book, I do sort of, I get into that, you know, I, I enter the, the territory of the material. I see. And I try to put myself at its service and let it, you know, let it come. And reading and, and, and starting to write and sitting down with other people, like they say, if you want to be a good writer, read a lot of books. If you want to be a good, if you're going to write good poetry, read a lot of poetry. So I'm curious, like how many, how many books are you sitting down reading every single year? Well, I, I'm not a giant reader, but I used to be in, in my younger years. Yeah. And um, I definitely believe that's true. And in fact, what I used to do is I would actually copy books. I would actually sit with a, with a, a copy of Hemingway or Henry Miller and a typewriter, and I would just copy page after page. And, um, and I think, you know, painters do that. They go to the museum and they'll sit down in front of, you know, Rembrandt or whatever, and they'll copy it stroke by stroke. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. You know, I bet in baseball there's something like that. I mean, don't you like pattern the way you would throw or swing a bat after somebody you want to swing like Derek Jeter or something like that? Yeah, just being around it, it's like the mirror neurons in our brain start firing, you know? Yeah. And we kind of take that on and put our own style to it. But yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, certainly I know that musicians will practice, you know, you know, how did B.B. King play this particular lick, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll practice it over and over and over. And the interesting thing, thing though, is that as after a while, your true self comes out, right? You know, after you've copied all the others, you sort of, they sort of go away and you kind of combine all of the you have Eric Clapton, B.B. King, whatever, and, and your own style kind of comes out all by itself. Yeah. What is the quote? If I've seen further than, than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> I think it's the same thing, right? Like, yeah. And I hear that with the musicians, like they, whatever they, whatever um, abilities they have, they always attribute it to the others, the mentors, yeah. the people that they looked up to, and they kind of um, combined all of those things to make their own, you know? And yeah. So, it's <laughs> great to hear a musician pay tribute to his mm -hmm. sources, you know? If you hear Keith yeah. Richards talk about, you know, the old bluesman that he copied their licks, you know? over and over and over again and how he just idolizes them. It's always great, great to hear. Yeah. Um, I've got just a few more questions for you, my friend. I want to ask your opinion. I'm going on an adventure here pretty soon. I'm going to, um, to a place in Southwest Texas. By the time this airs, I'll probably be in the middle of it, but I'm going there for 15 days. I'm bringing my backpack and my guitar and $50 leaving all of my other money at home, like my credit cards and everything. And I'm just going to immerse myself and see what happens and see what experiences I get to have and, and see who I get, you know, who I meet and, and just what comes up. What is your advice for that? Like, I'm not going to have my vehicle, but someone who has somewhat been there before, what is your advice for that? Well, let me ask you, when you say you're going to a place, what do you, what do you mean? A specific yeah. place? Yeah. Yeah. So a it's ranch. a ranch. So what do, where are you going? Great, good question. I was meditating on this when this idea came to me. I was like, okay, where do I want to go? And um, it's a little town in Southwest Texas. It's a little border town. And um, just, I've never been there. I don't know anybody there. And I've booked a flight and I've uh, got my transportation set up. Just, I booked a one way ticket. And ah. so, I don't know. I just, when I was preparing for this interview, I was like, I'm going to ask. Stephen, if he's got any advice, you know, I'm going to bring a lot of journals and a lot of books and I'm sure. I'm so sure you don't have any, you don't have any place you're going to stay or, or anything like the, that. This one will be uh -huh. with me because I'm sure this is going to come up a lot, but uh -huh. no, I don't have a place to stay. First thing I'll say, Mike, is I really salute you for doing this. You know, oh. I think it's a great, it's a great thing to do. And Thank you. really what you're kind of doing is you're, you're creating a little hero's journey for yourself, you know, yeah. uh, in a, in a, in a very uh, deliberate way, you know, I mean, the, the, the classic concept of the hero's journey is you leave a place that you know, and you go into the unknown mm -hmm. and you try to uh, just like you're doing by not only bringing a certain amount of money, you know, you're trying to cut yourself free from all of the crutches that you use. And what you're hoping for is a kind of a transformation, right? That, that uh, it's like a vision quest, like an American Indian vision quest, right? You're going to yeah. go out into, and I'm, I mean, did Aubrey's influence 
affect this at all? Because I know he loves to do stuff like, not literally <laughs> maybe that, but he loves to put himself into the unknown yeah. with no way of pulling the plug. Is, I'm is sure him? subconsciously like that, that played a factor, I'm sure, you know. Ah, so I, I think, you know, it, I think it's great that you're doing it and it takes a lot of guts, you know, and you'll probably be tempted to go, oh man, I wish I had my American Express card here at this yeah. moment. Um, and I think it probably, it's going to get out of control at some point, you know, in fact, that's the whole point of it, right? Exactly. Something's, something's going to get really fucked, you know, <laughs> and you're going to really have to fall, call on, on your resources. And so I don't know if there's any advice at all. My only thing, the advice is I'm just, I just applaud you for doing it. You know, oh. and I'd really love to hear what happens when, when you come back, you know, if you yeah. come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And those words are encouraging actually. Um, and that is it. Like what's going to come up that I'm, what, what attached, what am I attached to that I may not realize at this time, you know? Um, I, I think about it in, in like using the analogy, sitting on my couch at night, saying, I'm going to get up early in the morning and go work out, you know, if I haven't worked out in a while. It sounds like a great idea at the time, but then when your alarm's going off, you're like, what the fuck? That was a <laughs> terrible idea. I think that's going to be me on about day four. Yeah, I, I think it might be hour four, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or minute four. Yeah, but I do think I do think that definitely stuff will come up. I mean, not even just stuff from your own unconscious. But in the real world, people mm -hmm. will materialize and events will happen. And I think that, that those will not be random. In some way, they'll have meaning. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would just, would just you know, go with, go with it. You know, God bless you. You know, it's yeah. like a take it. It's like a psychedelic experience, right? You pull the plug, and there you, you know, there's no backing out. Yeah, I may have to combine the two. Yeah, maybe you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, before I let you go, man, I want to, I want to get into a man at arms. Um, I appreciate you sending this. I have, you see about how I've got a few pages marked here. I haven't gotten through the whole thing, but I have started it and I am thoroughly enjoying it. Um, but talk about that. I know that character has been in a few uh, other of your books. Um, what was it that led you to write this one? Um, this, the central character of a man at arms is kind of a, uh, the book is set in uh, the first century uh, AD, you know, a little few years after the crucifixion in Jerusalem and in the Sinai Desert in that area. And this character of Telamon is sort of the equivalent of like the Clint, Clint Eastwood's man with no name, you know, or a samurai, as you know from reading it. He's like the one man killing machine of the ancient world. He's sort of the archetypal warrior that can handle any sort of violent confrontation can live stand up to any adversity you know live through anything but he is he has kind of exhausted that archetype he's sort of at, he's, he's he's lived it in every dimension and he's he's stuck and he doesn't doesn't know where to go mm -hmm. and he takes an assignment he takes a job trying to from the romans who are the bad guys the roman empire ruling the world and he takes a job, and I'm sure that you, uh, I hope your readers know who St. Paul the Apostle was, that he wrote a bunch of letters in those days to the early Christian communities, the letters that became books in the Bible, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Romans, etc. And so our badass guy takes a job from the Romans to stop one of these letters from getting through to the to the Christian community at Corinth. And then I won't say what happens, except he becomes involved with a, a, little, a young girl, a nine-year-old girl, and some other mysterious characters. And what he thought was going to happen does not happen. It's kind of mm -hmm. like your adventure that you're about to go on, you know? <laughs> and it, what I can say is just that uh, he changes over the course. And this is a character that's sort of an alter ego for me that I've really loved all through other books of mine. Yeah. And I wanted to take him to another dimension of his own reality. And so that's what, what this book is about. That's awesome. Everything that you told about is up to the point to where I'm at right now. So uh, <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Uh, I look forward to finishing it. And um, I recommend anybody that's out there, definitely go check it out. Where can folks find the book? 
And where can they find uh, out more about Stephen Presto? Um, I, my website is just my name, Stephen Pressfield. You know, you can go there and there's all sorts of stuff about this particular book. And then up in the upper right hand corner, there's an X. And if you click on that, it'll take you to the underlying website. That's about the war of art and other stuff like that. But the book is available on Amazon, everywhere, bookstores, Barnes and Noble, everywhere. Perfect. Stephen, thank you again, my friend. Before you go, you on the on the topic of the war of art, do you mind reading an excerpt? Oh, right. Okay, let me go get my copy. I'm curious, Mike, to see what excerpt you've picked out. Yeah, I was gonna say, could you read my mind? It's um it was tough though. You know, as I looked through it, it was very tough to to figure out which one I wanted to have you read. But page 40, resistance and fear. All right, let's see if I can find this thing. Ah, okay. So it's a little more than a page. You want me to read the whole thing here? You know, I thought about it and um, to shorten it up, but then I was like, no, I want to hear the whole thing. If okay, you're, assuming not, you're good with that, yeah. Yeah, fine. It's not that long. Okay. okay the the, the, uh, the title of the chapter is Resistance and Fear. Are you paralyzed with fear? That's a good sign. Fear is good. Like self-doubt, fear is an indicator. Fear tells us what we have to do. Resistance is experienced as fear. The degree of fear equates to the strength of resistance. Therefore, the more fear we feel about a specific enterprise, the more certain we can be that that enterprise is important to us and to the evolution of to the growth of our soul. That's why we feel so much resistance. If it meant nothing to us, there'd be no resistance. Have you ever watched Inside the Actor's Studio? The host, James Lipton, invariably asks his guests, what factors make you decide to take a particular role? The actor always answers, because I'm afraid of it. The professional tackles the project that'll make him stretch. He takes on the assignment that will bear him into uncharted waters, compel him to explore unconscious parts of himself. Is he scared? Hell yes, he's petrified. Conversely, the professional turns down roles that he's done before. He's not afraid of them anymore. Why waste his time? So if you're paralyzed with fear, it's a good sign. It shows you what you have to do. Perfect. So I, you, I hope friend. you're afraid of this little adventure you're about to go on, Mike, because that means it's, it's exactly what you should be doing. Well, but, yeah, like that stuff has started coming up, you know, the the fears and the worries that then that's why I'm doing it. I want to see what comes up. I want to explore those thoughts and and see where my mind goes. So, well, God bless you. I think it's great. You know, some people would do something like that and they'd bring a camera crew. You know? <laughs> so, I couldn't do that to, to these guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? So thank you. know, God bless you that you're just going by yourself with a, you know, a little bit of money and that's it. You know, you're yeah. going to. You know, I am going to document hope, it. I'll do some blogs and and you know bring it back and I'll release some of that afterwards and 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 share. Oh, well, that'll be great. Listeners. That'll be great. I'm looking forward to hearing what happens to you. Yes, sir. Well, Stephen, thank you again, my friend. All right, thank you, Mike. We'll do it again sometime. I appreciate you sharing it with me. All right, I'm all my best to you and to your crew there. Thank you, Thanks my friend. A lot. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye for Bye. now.